Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to God's house for our worship today. The order of service is printed for you in the service folder that you received when you came into the Lord's house today. One note that was missed in the, in, on the introduction page is that we do have a guest preacher here with us uh, as I was away all week and I'm thankful that he uh, was willing to do this today. Uh, Dr. Mark Brown from Wisconsin Lutheran College, our pulpit assistant here for many years, you are familiar with him. He will be preaching the sermon from uh, the gospel today. Our opening hymn is in the hymnal number 260, we begin, or 230, I'm sorry. We begin our service with hymn number 230, Lord Jesus Christ be present now. children, but we have disobeyed him and deserve only his wrath and punishment. Therefore, let us confess our sins and plead for his mercy. Merciful Father in heaven, I am altogether sinful from birth. In countless ways I have sinned against you and do not deserve to be called your child. But trusting in Jesus, my Savior, I pray. Have mercy on me according to your unfailing love. Cleanse me from my sin and take away my guilt. God, our Heavenly Father, has forgiven all your sins. 
By the perfect life and innocent death of our Lord Jesus Christ, he has removed your guilt forever. You are his own dear child. May God give you strength to live according to his will. Amen. In the peace of forgiveness, let us praise the Lord. in us the seed of your word. By your Holy Spirit help us to receive it with joy and to bring forth fruits in faith and hope and love through your Son Jesus Christ our Lord who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit one God now and forever. Please be seated. God speaks to our hearts in his word. Our first reading today is from the prophet Amos chapter 7. Then Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, sent a message to Jeroboam, king of Israel. Amos has conspired against you in the midst of the house of Israel. The land is not able to endure all, his, all of his words. This is what Amos says. Jeroboam will die by the sword, and Israel will, will certainly go into exile, away from its own soil. Then Amaziah said to Amos, You seer, get out of here. Flee to the land of Judah. You may eat food and prophesy there. But you must never again prophesy Bethel, for it is the sanctuary of the king and the national temple. Then Amos responded to Amaziah, I was not a prophet, nor was I a son of a prophet, rather. I was a sheep breeder, and I took care of sycamore fig trees. But the Lord took me from tending flocks, and the Lord said to me, Go, prophesy to my people Israel. But now, hear the word of the Lord, you who are saying, Do not prophesy against Israel, and do not preach against the house of Isaac. This is what the Lord says. Your wife will be a prostitute in the city, and your sons and your daughters will fall by the sword. Your land will be parceled out with a measuring line, and as for you, you will die upon unclean soil. And Israel will certainly go into exile far away from its own soil. This is the word of the Lord. The psalm is Psalm 78. We sing the verses responsibly by the whole verse.
The second reading is from 1 Timothy chapter 3. The saying is trustworthy. If anyone aspires to become an overseer, he desires a noble task. It is necessary then for the overseer to be above reproach. The husband of only one wife, temperate, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not a drunkard, not a violent man, but gentle, not quarrelsome, but a lover of money. It is necessary that he manage his own household well, with all dignity, making sure that his children obey him. If a man does not know how to manage his own household, how will he take care of God's church? He must not be a recent convert or he might become conceited and fall into the same condemnation as the devil. In addition, he must have a good reputation with those outside the church so that he may not fall into disgrace and the devil's trap. This is the word of the Lord. basis the text for the sermon. Jesus called the twelve and began to send them out, two by two. He gave them authority over the unclean spirits. He instructed them to take nothing for their journey except a staff. No bread, no bag, no money in their money belts. They were to put on sandals, but not to wear two coats. He said to them, wherever you enter a house, stay there until you leave that area. Any place that will not receive you or listen to you, as you leave there, shake off the dust that is under your feet as a testimony against them. They went out and preached that people should repent. They also drove out many demons. They anointed many sick people with oil and healed them. The Gospel of the Lord. The hymn of the day is number 525 in the hymnal, The Son of God, Our Christ.
Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Seven days can be a long time ago. Do you remember the Gospel reading last Sunday? I know you heard it. In fact, Pastor Hacker said he preached on it. Do you remember? I won't read the whole thing, but it basically says Jesus went home to visit in his hometown synagogue in Nazareth. This is like the happy and nervous seminary student coming back from years away at school to preach in front of the crowd that all knew him as that naughty little boy in grade school. But of course, Jesus wasn't a naughty little boy. He went to the synagogue, he preached, everybody was amazed at his preaching, but then they were also bothered by it. They said, don't we know this guy? Don't we know his parents? Isn't this the carpenter's son? We went to school with his brothers and sisters. Who is he to come along now and tell us all these things and we're supposed to follow him? And Mark said, uh, Jesus, uh, Jesus said that Mark said, uh, Mark said that Jesus said, getting older, only in his hometown among his relatives and in his own house is a prophet without honor. And Mark said he could not do any miracles in that place because of their unbelief. So, what would Jesus do next? There are a few of us that are motivated by difficult conditions or by opposition. I've worked with a few people that I understood that the way to get them to do something was to say it can't be done. Most of us, however, are not wired that way. And most of us, if we would face opposition like this, would say, ah, bad idea. Let's try something else. Can you imagine Jesus? sending an email to his father, asking for a sit-down to talk about this project, and that the son would have said to the father, well, this was a good idea. I mean, we've given them more than they really deserve, but it's just not going to work. How about I come back home and work there? Well, today's Gospel reading tells us exactly what Jesus did in response to this. And you heard it. Instead of shutting down his ministry, he multiplied it. And he enlisted these men who had been traveling with him, listening to him, learning from him, being blessed by him, so that more and more they could go and do for others what he had done for them. Jesus gave them his ministry. And that is the point of the reading today. Jesus still gives us his ministry. Now there are some parts about this reading that we have to wonder, is this all still apply 20 centuries plus today to the church? Was some of it just limited to this time? Uh, well, we'll see. But Jesus gives us this ministry and notice in this brief reading from Mark that Jesus cares about the message, but he also cares for the messengers. A couple chapters before this, Mark listed off the names of those 12 men who were traveling with Jesus. There's a similar list in Matthew and in Luke and in Acts. And if you go through that list, you'll notice that there was not a single Pharisee or Sadducee no priest, no Levite, no church workers, as we might know them. He called common people, a half dozen or so fishermen, a reformed tax collector, some of them we don't know their occupation. Abraham Lincoln is said to have said one time, God must love the common people. He made so many of them, and Jesus chose some of them to be these messengers. But you'll notice that Jesus did not say to them, well, you've been 
with me for a couple of years. You must know some of my sermons practically as well as I do now. But tell you what, you tell them what you think they ought to hear. You decide, and I'll accept whatever message you give. That is not what Jesus said. He cared about the message. And so he wanted them to go to represent him with that message. And we have some of those instructions here. It says, they went out and preached that people should repent. Of course, you may remember that that was Jesus' message when he began his ministry. He said, the time has come, the kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. And repent means to have a complete turnabout in the way you think and in what you believe. You know, we sometimes say that repent means to change your mind, which is true, but it, I'm afraid it might sound like it's very trivial. And I don't know if this happens at your house, but occasionally I have seen situations where a member of the family were going to someplace nice or important, and I'll see a member of the family come through at about five minute intervals every time wearing a different outfit. And the person is having a hard, time what to wear, knowing what to wear. What can be especially dangerous is if a person can't decide between two pairs of shoes and puts one shoe on one foot and a different pair on the other and says, which do you like better? And then forgets to change the other foot. <laughs> See, we think, of, we think of changing our mind like, oh, I really wanted Spumoni, but they don't have it, so I'll have, you know, lemon instead. Repent is a much deeper kind of change. It is a change in which God turns us entirely around in terms of how we look at sin. Before we repent, we think that sin is cute, or at least it's not dangerous. That if you have to get by in life, you'd be smarter to sin than to do it the way you're supposed to. And then God confronts us with how he sees sin. It is rebellion. It is turning our backs on God. And sin is always going to destroy relationships and it's going to destroy our relationship with Him. But then, repentance does not leave us beat up and laying on the ground. Repentance shows us that God has changed His mind about us. He forgives us. He doesn't accept our sin, but He forgives us that sin and he does that through the perfect sacrifice of a substitute who takes our place to die for us. And so repentance is the invitation to change our mind about God. We don't have to be afraid of him and run away with him because he has a kind heart for us. That was the message. Now, Jesus also says that he gave them power so that they drove out many demons. I don't know about you, but when you take time to read the Gospels, that's one of the first things that strikes us modern people, is how there seem to be demons everywhere. And they are confronting Jesus and his apostles and trying to rattle them in his message. And oddly enough, sometimes they confess, I know who you are. There were no vacations for the demons during those three years. And it wasn't only that the devil and his angels were convincing people to sin and unbelief, but sometimes they were actually physically possessing people's bodies. Jesus, with his authority, could drive those demons out. He now gave that to his apostles. This is one we have to wonder about how much he gives today. It says that he sent them out to heal many of the sicknesses and heal diseases of the people. What a way for them to demonstrate the compassion but also the power of their master who cared about these broken people who could not see and could not hear and who had leprosy. Shows his authority, but that he also loved them. And then it says, any place that will not receive you or listen to you as you leave there, shake off the dust that is under your feet as a testimony against them. This is a powerful part of Jesus' message. That this is no either or type test question. 
You can follow him or you can follow somebody else. You take your pick. By shaking the dust off their feet, this was a somewhat public, symbolic way of saying, you have heard the message. And if you will not accept it, I don't want to take anything with you, not even the dirt off your ground with me. And when Judgment Day comes, don't offer as your defense that you never heard. Because you heard right here and now. Do you see how much Jesus cared about his message? And that he wanted his message to be carried faithfully to others? It seems that this is difficult to do today. I think for one thing it's difficult because that word repent can be troublesome. Today we have like a giant religious, I don't know, delicatessen. And people can chick, pick whatever they want to pick. And so they're liable to say, I don't want to choose any religion that makes me uncomfortable. I'd like something that fits my way of thinking. I have to challenge my students with that sometimes. You, you, can't go, you can't go into religion and religious questions and treat it as though you can, well, you know, I, I really like ice cream, I'll take two of those, but oh man, asparagus, you, you, can't, you can't do that. Any more than you can go to the airport and say, I want to get to Cleveland and I want any plane I get on to take me there. That doesn't work. The measure of a person's religion should not be how much it fits his thinking, but how much it changes his thinking. The call to repentance is that we are turned toward God, not that we can invent a God that we would like. And of course, with the religious smorgasbord, that also means that people can say, well, you know, maybe I should try Buddhism here. They all seem so nice. Buddhists seem to be more peaceful. You know, Christians have fought in all kinds of wars. We get sort of militant sometimes. But you must ask about every religion, what does it see as the problem, and then what does it offer as the solution? If a religion doesn't see the problem as sin, it's not going to offer any sort of solution for it at all. So this is a challenge to us to, be, to care as much about the message as Jesus did, and to care enough about how we put it out. Now this may have seemed like a terribly difficult, even dangerous responsibility. He's going to send them out to do what he's been doing. Hmm. And maybe you know this from your own job. You can watch somebody do something for years, and then when you have to do it, you forget half you knew, or you get scared to be in that spot. But Jesus also wanted to assure them that he cared about them as his messengers. So again, listen to some of the things he told them. This first one might almost slip by us without our noticing it. Jesus called the twelve. Jesus had selected them. He told them on another occasion, you did not choose me but I chose you. And so those of us who have the blessed privilege of being able to serve God's church, to teach, to preach, to travel, to go to other places, to preach on their behalf, it is a great assurance that we have been called for that, even in what may look like a very human and even mysterious process at times. And while people may think, I think this is what I would like to do for a living, or this is what my career should be, there is this sense that we are being found by God. And so we have the assurance that God calls through the church. That's the language we use. And that assurance can be very comforting at some difficult times. He had called these men. They didn't lose their imperfections or, you know, idiosyncrasies of character, but he called them to do this. 
Then he says he's going to send them out two by two. Nobody was going to go alone. Now this wasn't necessarily talking about the issue of whether uh, one of them could bring a wife along or not. It was two apostles at a time. Now, that certainly would be an encouragement when things were difficult. One could bolster the other. But I wonder if that wasn't there sometimes when things got, when were going too well too. One person by himself could be thinking, they must be coming because I'm really good. And they want to hear me. The other one say, get a grip on yourself here. This isn't about us. This is about the message that we're sharing. It is still wise today for churches, synods, to send people out in pairs or even in groups to difficult new places. It has sometimes happened we sent one missionary all by himself halfway around the world, and that didn't always go very well. Then he says, he gave them authority over the unclean spirits. He instructed them to take nothing for their journey except a staff. No bread, no bag, no money in their money belts. They were to put on sandals, but not to wear two coats. This seems kind of unusual. I sometimes feel a little bit guilty about this. I've looked at the moving van a couple of times and we've moved from one place to another. And I think, we aren't really traveling light here, are we? Do we really need all these things? Do I feel kind of guilty as an American call worker about how much we have? Or should I? But Jesus had a point here that we have to be careful that the messengers don't become more attached to their possessions than to the message. Because that could lead to them altering the message. Or going someplace where they might get a better deal, so to speak. He says, do not move around from one house to another. Can you imagine Peter telling Andrew, we're staying at a place where the guy's got a swimming pool. Come on over here and stay with us. People start to wonder about the message if it seems we care more about the blessings of this life than the message we're bringing. And after all, aren't we also telling people that all these things that become so important to us are all going to be gone someday? But the faith remains. And then he says, he that listens to you listens to me. So we have that assurance that we are acting for God himself. Jesus still gives the church this ministry. This is all of our ministry, regardless of what role you might be asked to play. We are blessed, I would say, to be in a church body that still honors pastors and teachers, not perfectly, but to a high degree. We care about the education that they get. And so we want missionaries, professors, teachers, to know what they are teaching. We want to continue to have a greater sense that this is a shared opportunity and a shared responsibility. And then all that, that although some messengers may stand behind wood, all of us get to be messengers of this good news in our lives. Because this is our ministry together. Jesus still cares about the message and cares for the messengers. And that is a part of the wonderful gospel that we all share. Amen. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. I invite you to stand as we confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, 
the holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Give us courage, like St. John the Baptist, to continue boldly proclaiming your whole counsel of salvation to a dying world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord of the Church, we commend to you all ministers of your word. Make them zealous and faithful that through their service your kingdom would grow. Send the Holy Spirit upon all who hear them to turn hearts from the love of sin to the love of you. Grant to our church's leaders and all pastors wisdom in their work and joy in their calling. Grant us an increase in those who prepare to serve in the office of the Holy Ministry and other church work vocations. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O oh Lord, in the waters of baptism you severed your people from any obligation to the old nature, sealed us with your spirit of promise and blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing. Grant that we may live our lives as people brought back from the dead to, to the praise of your glory. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Kind Master, you are near to all who are sick, to all who suffer, to all who grieve and pain. Have mercy on those who carry heavy burdens, that they may rest in your embrace. Look to you for relief and peace and wait in hope for the final healing of the resurrection through Jesus Christ. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Join these, our prayers and praises, with those of your faithful people of every time and every place, and unite them in the ceaseless petitions of our great High Priest until he comes again in great power and glory as victorious Lord of all. Through him, with him, and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. O Lord God, our Heavenly Father, pour out the Holy Spirit on your faithful people. Keep us strong in your grace and truth. Protect and comfort us in all temptation, and bestow on us your saving peace. Through Jesus Christ our Lord 
who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Brothers and sisters, go in peace. Live in harmony with one another. Serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen.